This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah. The land of Zebulon and Naph Naphtali, Naphtali, beside the sea, beyond the Jordan River, in Galilee, where so many Gentiles lived, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has, been sh has shined. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Then they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, <laughs> repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. <laughs> Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria, and the people soon began bringing to him all who were sick. And, whenever, and whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Okay. Large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and from the east of the Jordan River. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John, buddy. Okay. Yeah, please. Oh. Thanks, dude. Lord, I just want to lift Tom up to you this morning. I just pray that everything he is prepared to say to us this morning, God has been given straight from you, and it's going to come right out of his mouth and into our ears and mm. into our hearts. Mm. Bless the rest of this morning as we learn. Amen. 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 I'm good, man. Thank you. Good morning, lovely people. How are you? Good to see you all. Good job, John. Some tough words in there, man. <clears throat> Solid joke, yes. Um, today, guys, we're going to wrap up chapter 4 of Matthew's Gospel. And we've been looking at this narrative in small parts, and we've learned quite a bit so far. Hey, a lot of stuff going on. Um, and the main idea I want us to just to wrap our heads around is that we're learning that Israel is awaiting this promised Messiah who's going to restore blessing to all the nations and who will reconnect heaven and earth and God and man. He will do this by suffering and dying and coming out victorious through the test and then offering forgiveness to all humanity. This is the storyline we're a part of. And Matthew in his gospel is making the claim that this Messiah is actually Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son. Pretty bold claim. And so this morning, we've come to a pivotal point in the Gospel of Matthew. It's almost like a checkpoint. I've never run a marathon, but I imagine this is what a water station would feel like on a marathon. Where you're like, I just need just some water. I need to take a break for a second and just regather re myself and collect my thoughts. And so uh, we're going to take a second today and just check in before we move on into the Sermon on the Mount, which is going to be where we're camped between now and the end of June. So there's going to be a lot of stuff there. And so I want to just take a breath and take a second this morning. And I want to ask you a question. And I want you to think about it for more than like three seconds, okay? And I want you to keep it to yourself. You don't have to say it out loud. How are you doing? Like, actually. This isn't a test. There's not a right answer. How are you doing? You don't have to answer. You don't need to tell me or speak it out loud, but if you're taking notes or you have something to write it down, I just maybe just take a second and jot down. How are you actually doing? Type it in your phone, whatever you need to do. How are you doing? I'm convinced of something this morning, guys, that God... Father, Son, and Spirit, they have a vested interest in how you answer this question. And not only that, they have something to offer you. They have something on offer for all of us today in response to this answer that you have to this question. 
And the person of Jesus has something to say about that. And over the years, I mean, we come together every Sunday and we give up time to sleep, time with our bed or couch or other people to come together and to join our voices in worshiping Jesus and thinking about Jesus and learning from the scriptures about who Jesus is and what he's done. And so there must be some type of relevance that, that keeps us coming back and, um, and, and has brought people back for centuries over you know, race, time, whatever it might be. And Dallas Willard has this to say about this very thought. I think we finally have to say Jesus' enduring relevance is based on his historically proven ability to speak to, to heal, and empower the individual human condition. He matters because of what he brought and what he still brings to ordinary human beings, living their ordinary lives and coping daily with their surroundings. He promises wholeness for their lives. In sharing our weakness, he gives us strength and imparts through his companionship a life that has the quality of eternity. Let's just pray together and then we'll hop into the scripture together. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that you know every single person in this room. You know their answer, whether dishonest or partially honest or fully honest to that question we just asked. And I ask, Lord, that by your spirit, um, you would come minister hope and healing and life to each and every person here this morning. Lord, that going back to that picture from worship, those side doors that you're knocking on, Lord, will we open the door to you this morning? And would you come in and have your way? Lord, I thank you that you're here with us in this room, that, that we can hold on to the promise in your word that says where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And so, Lord, we want to honor your presence here with us. Lord, would you help us as we look at this story? Um, would we glean from it what you would have us glean? And would we leave here, Lord, having a, an experience, a tangible experience of, of meeting with you, Jesus, the healer, the king, the redeemer, uh, the one who sets all things to right. And so we look to you, Lord. I pray that you would anoint my mouth to speak the good news of the kingdom coming, the kingdom amongst us. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. So if you guys have your Bibles, let's pick up, and we're going to read um, the first few verses that John read so well for us. Um, John chapter 4, let's read verses 12 through 16. Sorry, Matthew 4, 12 through 16. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then left there in the region of Zebulun. And this fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah, in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali beside the sea, beyond the Jordan River in Galilee, where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. So Jesus is ready to begin his public ministry. There's been all this preparation that he's gone through, and he heads back to where his mom and his brothers still lived. He went back to work in a primarily Gentile region in the north of Israel there, and he sets up a home base in Capernaum, which is a Galilean frontier town. Um, it's interesting because he begins to minister not in the bright city lights of Jerusalem, but in the farthest outposts of Jewish life, which is an interesting thing. Here where the darkness was most dense and so far removed from the center of religious life in Jerusalem, these are the first to see a great light of God's deliverance in Jesus. What I want us to think about here is this. Jesus cares about the parts of us that are far from the city lights. The forgotten places. The places that we overlook. The dark places. And it is into these places that the good news is preached. So I'm going to ask you again, how are you doing? What we read here is that the preparations for Jesus' messianic ministry are complete. And here we reach the turning point in the gospel, which is verse 17. So let's read together verse 17. From then on, so all the preparation is done. He set up his home base. He's preaching light into the darkness. Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, if I were to ask you, 
What does Jesus talk about more than anything else during his ministry? What would you say? Dang it, John. The kingdom. Bill. I wasn't here when Bill was here. Steve Best. Otherwise known as Bill Best. So good. So Jesus talks about the kingdom more than anything else. So if you're going to to try to summarize Jesus' ministry, his message, it is simply the kingdom. And um, we're going to watch a Bible project video to explain the good news of the kingdom. Let me, do I need to move this? One sec, Katie, it's kind of cut off. Someone want to kill the lights? No. Shoot. Okay. Anything else, guys? And all of these Jewish people have been sent away into exile, but a few remain in the city. And they're left wondering what just happened that God abandoned us. Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now, Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls. And far out on the hills, we see a messenger. and He's running towards the city. He's running and he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet. Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? That despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. And so when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, they mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger, bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, powerful, successful kingdom that needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies, giving them and seeking peace. This is an upside-down kingdom. Now, Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah, so for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high-ranking Roman officer. He comes to Jesus, begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people, forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right. But for Jesus... This is what had to happen. Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people, Israel, as just one small part of the entire human condition. All of humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. But so how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies.
This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto a throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself, and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside-down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. Thanks for watching this channel. We do this because we believe the Bible. Good stuff. So again, verse 17, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near, or some translations say at hand. Uh, Dallas Willard quote we read a couple weeks ago about this whole idea of repentance is um, going to come up on the screen. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. It's okay. It's basically rethink your thinking, is what he says. Don't bang your head against the floor. Oh, there we go. Repentance is not beating your head on the floor or feeling bad about your sins. It is to rethink your thinking so as to change the way you've been thinking and acting. We repent in light of the gospel of Jesus. Or in other words, hey guys, pay attention. You have to think differently. The kingdom is here. The place where God wants done is done is breaking in right here, right now. Come this way. Turn away from living for your own kingdom and come live with your whole heart, soul, and mind and strength with me and my kingdom. Come learn a new way to be human. Come see that I have defeated sin, Satan, and death. Come bow to the true king. Come live with me. Jesus, you see, is announcing that anyone is welcome into his kingdom. He is the door to walk through. He alone has won the victory. He saved us not because of our own righteousness, but because of his mercy. Anyone who is willing is invited to step out of the kingdom of self and into the kingdom of God. This, of course, is a total change of mind, which in turn will become a total change of life. The announcement of the arrival of God's kingdom is life-altering news. And I can think of a few life-altering announcements in my own life. Can you, I'm sure you have your own. But I remember Jess telling me that she was pregnant with our oldest daughter, Lily. Um, and that turned our entire world upside down. Like, I don't know how to put a car seat in. We almost got a divorce over that. Um, and on and on the stories could go. Or another is when our family realized we couldn't eat gluten anymore. And so our entire diet needed to change. And we're all of a sudden in Zares, like reading labels for hours and things were different. Our lives had to be reoriented or rearranged based on this announcement. So this is a call for us to reconsider how we have been approaching our life. That's what Jesus is saying to us this morning. In light of the fact that we now, in the very presence of Jesus, have the option of living within the surrounding movements of God's eternal purposes, of essentially taking our life into his life. And Jesus, as he stands before us, and, and he's in this room with us this morning as we're thinking about him and put, placing him before our minds, Jesus is the good news about the kingdom himself. So when we, I, I want us to get, get our heads around this. When we think about Jesus, we need to think about the kingdom. When we think about the kingdom, we need to think about Jesus. It's not like social structures or things like that. It's Jesus. And those things will come. But Jesus' message is the kingdom, and the kingdom is the message of Jesus. He is the king who embodies the rule and reign of God, who is calling unto himself a people and teaching them. He's going to show us how to co-rule co with him. And this, of course, is the process of discipleship. How is your life going? How are you doing? Would you like to learn how to live life in the kingdom of God? And this is where the story continues, and we're going to read together in verse 18 to 22. Jesus' invitation to come follow me. So if he's the king, he's going to show us how to live a new life. How do we get into this process? How does this happen? One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fish for a living. Jesus called out to them, Hey, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. 
A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. One of the things that I first noticed, and you probably did too in this, in this scripture, is that how Jesus pursued his disciples. This is not the norm at the time for the rabbi, as an apprentice would often go to the rabbi and ask, hey, can I follow you? And he would kind of go through the selection process and determine whether or not he wanted them to follow him. But Jesus is going out and asking them, hey, come follow me. He's the rabbi. They are the apprentices. So he's typically, he's flipping it on its head in the typical Jesus way. But in Jesus, we see in that the heart of the pursuing God who comes to find his lost and weary children. He's knocking on the door. Come follow me. One thing I think I want us to kind of think about here is this. The presence of Jesus in the process of our learning to live life in the kingdom of God is so essential for us to remember. What I mean by that is he's actually with us in this process. He's not standing at a distance auditing and monitoring our behavior but he's right there with us. And we see this as Jesus comes and finds the fishermen in their everyday ordinary lives. And he invites them into an apprenticeship of life in the kingdom of God. So this verse, guys, you may remember, is the basis of a whole series we did in 2021 called The Shift, which is our reimagining what our church family could be focusing on in all that we do. And we've developed these triangles, which um, everyone has seen these many times. But I just want to walk through them one more time. And so we are experiencing this realization that, hey, life with myself at the center is not working. I am often finding myself isolated from myself and from God and from other people. My life is disintegrated. I'm hiding parts of myself. I have a work self, a home self, a church self. And I just feel stuck. I feel stagnant. There's no real purpose to my life beyond just kind of protecting myself and projecting this image of whatever I feel like is healthy or good or the world is telling me to be. And then we hear this call from Jesus, hey, come follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. And so in that response, in in this invitation, what we're gonna see is life kind of flips itself back into the way it should be. Instead of isolation, we're gonna feel and experience this new intimacy with God and with other people. And where we felt disintegrated and where we felt like there were many versions of ourselves over time and over um, painful moments, but moments of God breaking in and making us whole again, we're going to be transformed into the image of Jesus. And this is all going to be kind of lived out on this mission of doing what Jesus did, of partnering with his life and his ministry to bring the kingdom and announce the arrival of God's kingdom. So another shorthand of, uh, of thinking about this is in intimacy, the goal is to be with Jesus. In formation or transformation, the goal is to become like Jesus. And with mission, the goal is to do what Jesus did. And this is based off of um, how uh, rabbis and apprentices used to work. They, the, as, as, a, as an apprentice said yes to the, or as an apprentice found a rabbi, their three life goals became those very things, to be with their rabbi, to become like their rabbi, and to do what their rabbi did. And so in our case, Jesus is coming to us and inviting us, hey, come follow me. And he's, he's inviting us into a life with the same three goals to be with him, to become like him, and to do what he did. Um, And that's what our values are in in our whole discipleship process, is intimacy, being with Jesus, formation, becoming like Jesus, and mission, doing what Jesus did. This is what we're about at Anchor Point. Uh, We want Jesus to be so real and tangibly known that the same response we see here happens in our own lives and in the lives of our neighbors and those out in the entire community. How are you doing? Could you use some help with understanding life in the kingdom and what it actually looks like? This is where, again, Jesus is so helpful for us. Let's read together the rest of our text for today. Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. As he healed every kind of disease and illness, news about him spread as far as Syria and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick. And whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and from east of the Jordan River. Teaching, announcing, and healing. 
Um, I heard something this week that was really helpful about this whole breakdown. Uh, Tim Mackey was talking about this. He said, teaching is important because the kingdom of God needs a lot of explanation. Anyone else? Like, that's like a breath of fresh air. I'm like, okay. Sometimes I read this. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about, Jesus? Some of the parables. But he's, he's taking the time and he's teaching these people, these fishermen, these uh, fisherwomen, these people that are in all these villages about what the kingdom of God is actually like. We need to relearn how to be human in light of the arrival of the kingdom. And Jesus is happy to teach us what that means. Announcing, which means bringing light to the darkness of our own delusion and brokenness. Announcing the arrival of God's kingdom. And then finally, healing, which is the tangible manifestation of God's reign and the pushing back of darkness and all of its effects. Some powerful stuff. And so guys, look at your Bible. Uh, there's a lot of red words between here and a few more pages to the right, correct? If you have red letters in your Bible. If not, these are all Jesus' words that we're going to be looking at in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. So from here until the end of June, we're going to be in these, in my Bible, these next two pages. It's a lot in there. And so this is what we're going to learn about, like, if we're thinking about the kingdom of God, this is the, the teaching, the word. This is what the Sermon on the Mount will unpack. This is what life looks like in the kingdom of God, how we do it, the new set of ethics that we're going to have. And then if we keep going in Matthew chapters 8 and 9, which we will be in in the fall, is Jesus expressing and living out the kingdom of God in word and so in deed. So he's taught us about it and now he's going to be living it out in deed. And we're going to see all kinds of miracles and signs and wonders as God's kingdom breaks into the world. So that's where we're heading. So if you guys, let's flip over in your Bible to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. So chapters 5 through 7 is the word, and chapters 8 through 9 is the deed. So chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. Does that sound familiar? Okay, so he starts there. Matthew starts there in chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4, and ends there in chapter 9. So it's kind of a bookend of what the kingdom of God looks like in word and deed, in the teaching of Jesus, and in his proclaiming and healing and announcing the kingdom of God. A few quotes here. In what sense, then, did Jesus declare that the kingdom of God was present? Our answer must at least begin with his own answer to John. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. In the ministry of Jesus himself, the divine power is released in effective conflict with evil. C.H. Dodd. And Michael J. Wilkins says this, Jesus was powerful enough to conquer the devilish ruler of the world, universal enough to include both Jews and Gentiles in his messianic gospel, authoritative enough to transform simple men into leaders of movements that change the course of history, and effective enough to attend the basic needs of the people, body, soul, and spirit. This is the kind of messianic deliverer that advances the kingdom of God. So as we come to a close this morning, guys, one of the biggest desires that I have for our church family is that we would learn to live out what we believe in the everyday ordinary events of our lives. Like the really boring mundane stuff, the middle of the road stuff, and the really beautiful and profound stuff. All of life is, I want us to learn how to live as disciples, as apprentices of Jesus, as people in the kingdom of God in every aspect and avenue of our lives. So this announcement of the arrival of the kingdom of God, that it's at hand, isn't just good news for our prayer meetings and sermons and for the choruses of our worship songs. This is good news for your everyday ordinary life, for your wants and your needs and your longings. All of these will only find their ultimate healing and fulfillment in the king and the kingdom he brings. Another Willard quote, talking about Jesus. If he were to come today, he would, do, he would very well do what you do. He could very well live in your apartment or house, hold down your job, have your education and life prospects, and live within your family and time. None of this would be the least hindrance to the eternal kind of life that was his by nature and becomes available to us through him. Our human life, it turns out, is not destroyed by God's life, but is fulfilled in it 
and it alone. So whatever you do with your everyday ordinary life, it does not, it's not a hindrance to God. It's not like, oh, that's not, that's too boring for me. I'm not going to engage. He's right there and willing to come live life with you. So as we go on in this series, we are going to be confronted, guys, with the reality of God's kingdom. In the teachings of Jesus, he's going to be getting up all up in our business. As he addresses things like sex, money, relationships, worry, just to name a few. So I want us to be clear here. Not a single one of us will be unaffected as we head into this next chunk of time. But in this, we must remember that he is with us. He is committed to showing us a better way. He is inviting us back into our original design of partnering with him and spreading the goodness and beauty of his kingdom to all the earth. Hear this this morning. You are not alone. You are not on your own. He is working in you and through you to restore God's image in you and in those around you. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says this, The real Son of God is at your side. He is beginning to turn you into the same kind of thing as himself. He is beginning, so to speak, to inject his kind of life and thought, his Zoe, into you. Beginning to turn the tin soldier into a live man, The part of you that does not like it is the part that is still tin. So in closing, let me read Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 11. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So one more time as I close, how are you doing? 